In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is October 4th, 2024, here at the Oratory in New Hampshire. It is the first Friday of October, so we want to receive Holy Communion in reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and to do them nine Fridays in a row, if possible, <clears throat> if not receiving physically Holy Communion, certainly at least spiritually for those who cannot be at Mass. But that's why we try to have the live stream to enable the faithful to allow them to follow the Mass, send their guardian angel at the Mass, receive Holy Communion, spiritually at least, and they will receive a, a share in the graces of the Mass as well. October is a beautiful month. It is begins with Saint Remy, who was anointed a king and a saint. And then we have the feast on October 2nd, the Feast of the Guardian Angels. And then yesterday, Saint Therese of the Child Jesus, and today, Saint Francis of Assisi. So October has some heavy hitters and the saints who love humility, who love simplicity, who love the childlike approach towards the Sacred Heart of Jesus. As St. Teresa says, when I look at the big saints, they're like huge trees, gigantic trees in the forest. St. Bernard and St. Augustine and St. John Chrysostom. And she says, there's no way I could ever be a saint like that. It's just not possible. But I know what I will be. I will be a little flower in God's garden that he will bend over and, and pluck and pick up and sit on his lap to enjoy. So this is also like St. Francis of Assisi. He really took to his life the words, Learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. So let's look at his life briefly, some main points worth mentioning in his life. St. Francis was born in Assisi in 1182. His father was Pietre Bernardo Bernardone, and he ran a material business, selling fine materials for people who could afford it. And then his wife was Pica, and they were a good couple. They would be considered today a very good Catholic couple. And especially today because they stayed married till the day they died. In an age of divorce, just to be married is heroic. But this couple here, they were, were quite worldly in the sense that they were very involved with their business. And St. Francis he grew up in this atmosphere. So he saw his parents very engrossed in material things. And St. Saint Francis caught that spirit. The trade of his parents, this is from our Father Albin Butler. In his youth, he was too much led away with vain amusements and was very intent on, on gaining temporal things. But St. Francis never let loose the reins of his sensual appetites, nor placed his confidence in worldly riches. And it was his custom never to refuse an alms to any poor man who asked it of him for the love of God. One day, being very busy with his affairs, he let a beggar go away without an alms but immediately reproaching himself with, with the lack of charity, he ran after the poor man, gave him an alms, and bound himself by a vow never to refuse it to any poor man that should ask it for the love of God. This vow he kept to his death. St. Francis, while he was yet living in the world, was meek, patient, very kind, generous to the poor beyond what his circumstances seemed to allow. 
Whenever he heard the love of God named, he felt in his soul an interior spiritual jubilation. His patience under two accidents which befell him contributed greatly to the improvement of his virtue. The one accident was in a war between the cities of Perugia and Assisi. He with several others was carried away as a prisoner by the Perugians. So these are the big Italian families warring against each other. This affliction he suffered a whole year with great alacrity and comforted his companions in prison. So that shook him up a bit and got him to see, you know, he could die in prison. He could have been killed. The, sh the vanity and the shortness of this life. The second incident was a long and dangerous sickness which he had with so great patience and piety that by the weakness of his body his spirit gathered greater strength and improved in the unction of the Holy Ghost and the divine gift of prayer. So similar to St. Therese, when she was nine years old, she got very sick and there was even a danger of death and she prayed and that's when she she prayed to the Virgin Mary, and the statue of Our Lady of the Smile that was in her room came to life. And St. Therese saw her smile, and she was cured after that. So Our Lady encouraged her to go and be generous with God, to give of herself totally to God. So St. Francis is feeling the drawing of the Holy Ghost in this direction, after his recovery from his sickness, he rode out one day in, in a new suit of clothes, meeting on the road a decayed gentleman, then reduced to poverty and very poorly dressed. He was touched with compassion and changed clothes with him. The following night he seemed to see in his sleep a magnificent palace filled with rich weapons all marked with the sign of the cross. And St. Francis thought he heard one tell him that these weapons belonged to him and his, and his soldiers, if they would take up the cross and fight courageously under its banner. After this, he gave himself much to prayer, by which he felt in his soul a great contempt for all transitory things and an ardent desire of selling all his goods and buying the precious jewel of the gospel. He knew not yet how he should best do this, but he felt certain strong inspirations by which our Lord gave him to understand that the spiritual warfare of Christ is begun by mortification and the victory over oneself. These interior motions awakened him and inflamed him every day more and more to desire to attain to the perfect mortification of his senses and contempt of himself. So riding one day in the plains of Assisi, he met a leper whose sores were, th were so disgusting that at the sight of them he was struck with horror and suddenly recoiled. But overcoming himself, St. Francis stepped off the horse and as the leper stretched forth his hand to receive an alms, St. Francis, while he gave him the alms, kissed his sores with great tenderness. So here St. Francis overcame the natural repugnance towards a very contagious disease. Resolving with fresh ardor to aim at Christian perfection, he had no relish but for solitude and prayer. And he begged our Lord with great fervor to reveal to him his holy will. Being one day wholly absorbed in God, he seemed to behold Christ hanging upon his cross, from which vision he was so tenderly touched that he was never afterwards able to remember the sufferings of Christ without shedding many tears. And from that time he was animated with an extraordinary spirit of poverty, charity, and piety. You can see when you visit Assisi, on the hillside, there is a statue of St. Francis as, at this age as a young man, and where he used to often go sit and look out and pray and just think. 
And from that hillside, when you, when you sit there, you can see all the valleys, many distant valleys uh, with vineyards and mountains in the distance. It's, it's beautiful Italy. Very similar to this area, actually, and of New Hampshire. St. Francis often visited the hospitals. He served the sick as if in them he had served Christ himself. And he would kiss the ulcers of the lepers with great affection and humility. So it was a miracle he never caught it. He gave to the poor sometimes part of his own clothes and sometimes money. He took a journey to Rome to visit the tombs of the apostles and finding a multitude of poor before the door of St. Peter's Church. He gave them his clothes to one who he thought to be most in need and clothing himself with the rags of that poor man, he remained all that day in the company of those beggars, feeling an extraordinary comfort and joy in his soul. Having interiorly the cross of Christ imprinted on his heart, he endeavored earnestly to mortify and crucify his flesh. One day as he was praying in the church of St. Dam Damian, St. Damiano, outside the walls of Assisi before a crucifix, he seemed to hear a voice coming from the crucifix, which said to him three times, Francis, go and repair my house which thou seest falling, which you see is falling to pieces. St. Francis, seeing that the church was old and ready to fall to the ground, thought our Lord commanded him to repair it. He therefore went home. <laughs> he went home, and by an action which was only justifiable by the simplicity of his heart and the right of a partnership with his father in trade, for he was then 25 years old. St. Francis took a horse and wagon and a load of clothes out of his own father's warehouse and sold it with the horse at Foligny, a, t a town 12 miles from Assisi. Today it's called Foligno. The price he bought, the price of all the material that he sold, he brought to the old poor priest of San Damiano, desiring to stay with him. The priest consented to staying with him, but would not take the money, which St. Francis therefore laid in a window. His father, hearing what had been done, came in a rage. Italian anger, here it is. Came in a rage to San Damiano, the church but was somewhat pacified upon recovering his money, which he found in the window. St. Francis, to shun his anger, had, had hid himself, but after some days spent in prayer and fasting, appeared again in the streets, though so disfigured and poorly dressed that the people pelted him and called him a madman, all which he bore with joy. So if you've ever been to Assisi, it's a, it's a little town. So everybody knew Pietro and his crazy son, Francis. And the word got around, Francis has gone nuts. But such is the nuttiness of the saints sometimes. His father, Pietro, more angry than ever, carried Francis home, beat him unmercifully, put chains on his feet and locked him up in a chamber till his mother set him free while his father was gone. St. Francis returned to San Damiano Church and his father followed him there and insisted that he should either return home or renounce before the bishop all his share in his inheritance and all manner of expectation from his family. The son accepted to, sell, to give his inheritance away with, with joy. He gave his father whatever he had in his pockets, told him he was ready to undergo more insults and chains and punches for the love of Jesus Christ, whose disciple he desired to be, and cheerfully went with his father before the bishop of Assisi 
to make a legal renunciation to his inheritance in a formal way. Coming into the presence of the bishop and his father, St. Francis, impatient of delays, while the instrument was drawn up, made the renunciation by the following action, carrying it in his fervor further than was required. St. Francis stripped himself of his clothes and gave them to his father, saying cheerfully and meekly, Up till now I have called you father on this earth, but now I say with more confidence, Our father who art in heaven, in whom I place all my hope and treasure. He renounced the world with greater pleasure than others can receive its favors, hoping now to be freed from all that which is most apt to make a division in our hearts with God or even to drive him, him quite far away. The bishop admired St. Francis's fervor, covered him with his cloak, and shedding many tears, ordered some garment or other to be brought in for St. Francis. The cloak of a country laborer a servant of the bishop, was found near at hand. St. Francis received this first alms from the bishop with many thanks, made a cross on the garment with chalk, and put it on. This happened in the 25th year of his age, in the, in the year 1206. St. Francis went out of the bishop's palace in search of some convenient retirement, singing the divine praises along the highways. He was met by a band of robbers in a forest who asked him who he was. St. Francis answered with confidence, I am the herald of the great king. They beat him and threw him into a ditch full of snow. <laughs> St. Francis rejoiced to have been so treated and went on singing the praises of God. He passed by a monastery and there received an alms as an unknown poor man. In the city of Gubbio, one who knew him took him into his house and gave him an entire suit of clothes, which were decent, though poor and humble. These he wore two years with a girdle, that is a belt around his waist, and shoes, and he walked with a staff in his hand like a hermit. At Gubbio, he visited the hospital of the lepers and served them, washing their feet and wiping and kissing their ulcers. For the repairs of the church of San Damiano, he gathered alms and begged in the city of Assisi, where all had known him as, a, as the rich boy in town. Now he's the beggar. He bore with joy all the mockeries and contempt with which he was treated by his father, his brother, and all his, his acquaintance that knew him. And if he found himself to blush upon receiving any confusion, he endeavored to court and increase his disgrace in order to humble himself the more and to overcome all inclinations of pride in his heart. For the building of San Damiano Church, he himself carried stones and served the stonemasons, and saw that church put in good repair. Having a singular devotion to St. Peter, he next did the same for an old church which was dedicated in honor of St. Peter. After this, he retired to a little church called Porciuncola, belonging to the abbey of the Benedictine monks of Subiaco, who gave it that name because it was built on a small estate of or parcel of land which belonged to them. It stands in a spacious open plain almost a mile from Assisi and was at that time forsaken and in ruined condition. The retiredness of this place was very agreeable to St. Francis and he was much delighted with the title which the church bore, it, it being dedicated in honor of Our Lady of the Angels. So he had a great devotion to the angels. He had a great devotion to Our Lady, Queen of Angels. And in this church is the, the little tiny shack, I guess we could say, made of stone where St. Francis died. He died in that little house that's inside the huge church.
He spent two years in sighs and tears when hearing one day those words of Christ, Do not carry gold or silver or a script for your journey or two coats or a staff, which was read in the gospel at Mass. St. Francis desired of the priest after Mass an exposition of these words, and he took them literally to himself and gave away his own money and leaving off his shoes, staff, and leather, leather belt, contented himself with one poor coat, which he girt about him with a cord. This was the habit which he gave to the Franciscan friars the following year. It was the dress of the poor shepherds and country peasants in those parts of Italy. The saint added a short cloak over the shoulders and uh, a hood to cover the head. St. Bonaventure in 1260 made this capuche, this, this hood or mozetta, a little longer to cover the chest and shoulders. Some of the very habits which the saint wore are still shown in Assisi. So yes, when you go there, you can see the habit worn by St. Francis. And it's quite tethered, but you can still see it and the incorrupt body of St. Clair. In, in this dress, he exhorted the people to penance with such energy that his words pierced the hearts of his hearers. Before his discourses, he saluted the people with these words, Our Lord give you peace, which he sometimes said he had learned by divine revelation. Our Lord give you peace. They expressed the salutation which Christ and St. Paul used. God had already favored St. Francis with the gift of prophecy and miracles. When he was begging alms to repair the church of San Damiano, he used to say, Help me to finish this building. Here will one day be a monastery of holy virgins, by whose good fame our Lord will be glorified over the whole church. This was verified in St. Clair five years later, who inserted this prophecy in her last will and testament. Before this, a man in the Duchy of Spoleto was afflicted with a horrible running cancer, which had gnawn both his mouth and cheeks in a hideous manner. Having without, received, without receiving any benefit, had recourse to all remedies that could be suggested and made several pilgrimages to Rome for, for the recovery of his health. And then he came to St. Francis, and would have thrown himself at his feet. But the saint prevented him and kissed his ulcerous sore on his face, which was instantly cured. I know not, says St. Bonaventure, which I ought most to admire, such a kiss or such a cure. So St. Francis, there's so much and I'm just reading a, two pages out of 15 pages here on St. Francis. But St. Francis would later gather together around him some of the young men of Assisi who saw that he wasn't crazy after all, and he really loved our Lord, and he was really living the gospel. And then he would make a pilgrimage to Rome to visit the Pope. And the Pope wasn't all that impressed, he was dressed as a beggar. He probably didn't smell too great either in the heat of Rome. But that night, Pope Innocent III had a dream, and he saw St. Francis and St. Dominic holding up the church that was about to collapse. And so Pope Innocent sent one of the servants to go find that poor beggar that was there the day, the day before. So they found him in some streets in Rome, and they called St. Francis in. And he came with a few of his brothers, and Pope Innocent approved their rule. This was a great joy for St. Francis, and that was the birth of the Franciscan order. A lot of the Franciscans say the only one that can really live the rule of St. Francis was St. Francis. Why? Because... St. Francis practiced the most abject poverty possible. But when you pull together men to live in community, 
a religious house, you can't live in abject poverty, otherwise you just can't live. You need water, you need food. Food requires a kitchen, kitchen requires dishes, dishes requires a sink, and a sink requires soap. I mean, life must continue. <laughs> so, so that's why uh, the Franciscans say the only one that really lived the Franciscan life was St. Francis. The others became, there are many saints from the Franciscan order, and they do keep the vow of poverty. And so St. Francis, he would receive later in his life the stigmata. He would bear in himself the wounds of Christ in his hands and feet. He made numerous prophecies. He would started to go blind in his older age. He wasn't that old either. And when he was dying, he, he said these last words while he was dying. He insisted in being laid on the ground and covered with an old habit, which the guardian gave him. In this posture, he exhorted his brothers to the love of God, to love holy poverty and patience, and give us, he gave his last blessing to all his disciples, the absent as well as those that were present in the following words. Farewell, my children. Remain always in the fear of the Lord. That temptation and tribulation which is to come is now at hand, and happy shall they be who shall persevere in the good they have begun. I hasten to go to our Lord, to whose grace I recommend you. He then caused the history of the Passion of our Lord in the Gospel of St. John to be read, after which he began to recite the 141st Psalm, which says, I have cried with my voice to the Lord, etc. Having repeated this last verse, Bring my soul out of prison that I may, may praise thy name. The just wait for me till thou reward me. There he yielded up his soul on October 4th, 1226, the 20th after his conversion and the 45th year of his age. Great multitudes flocked to see and kiss the prince of the sacred wounds in his flesh, which were openly shown to all people. A certain learned man of rank named Jerome doubted of the reality of, the, of these miraculous wounds till he had touched and examined them with his hands and moved the nails of flesh backwards and forwards, by which he was so evidently convinced that he confirmed by a solemn oath uh, his attestation of them, as St. Bonaventure mentions. The next morning, which was Sunday, the saint's body was carried with a numerous and pompous procession from the monastery of Portsuncola to Assisi. The, prep, the procession stopped at San Damiano Church, where St. Clare and her nuns had the comfort of kissing the marks of the wounds in his flesh. St. Clare attempted to take out one of the nails of flesh, but could not, though the black head was was sticking out above the palm of the hand, and she easily thrust it up and down and dipped a linen cloth in the blood which issued out. The body was carried there, from there, and buried at St. George's. So ever since, St. Francis worked many, many miracles. St. Francis still affects the world today with the spirit of St. Francis, the spirit of, of love of God, of chastity, the spirit of poverty, simplicity, humility, forgiving. And this spirit permeates all religious life. St. Benedict, um, he has the same simplicity and poverty and spirit in his rule. St. Francis differs because Franciscans would go out and preach. Many of them would be ordained priests. St. Anthony will be a, one of the Franciscans who met St. Francis. He would teach theology and then go and preach against heretics. And one final word about St. Francis. <clears throat> Today in all the Navasoto churches, they're singing that, that song, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And they're having a new mass 
They're joining hands and clapping and giving the kiss of peace around the table and, and praising the ecumenism of Pope Francis. But St. Francis of Assisi was not ecumenical. And this is where they, the modernists sadly mistaken him. If St. Francis was ecumenical, he would never have traveled across the sea, the Mediterranean, to northern Egypt and travel, risking his life, to go to, during the, this was the time of the Crusades. So he didn't go to go battle, but he went to go to convert the sultan. And the sultan received St. Francis after many threats to St. Francis's life. <clears throat> they finally said, all right, this, this crazy man from Europe wants to see you. St. Francis went to the sultan and told him about our Lord Jesus Christ told him about how Christ died for his soul, told him about how Muhammad only came 600 years after Christ. And St. John says all revelation was complete by the book of the Apocalypse. It's finished. So there can be no new revelation. And St. Francis showed him this, that Muhammad was an imposter. And he pointed out also Muhammad's errors, that he... He praises lying, cheating, all kinds of impurity, pedophilia, and all, uh, all these vices promoted in the Quran. And he finally challenged the sultan to walk over a whole bed of red-hot coals in flames. And he said, let's walk, I'll go first, and I'll show you who the true God is. And whoever comes off unscathed has the true God. Are you willing to do it? And the sultan said, uh, I'd like your bravery, but I'm not up to that. So he sent him off with gifts. He was impressed with St. Francis. He sent him off with gifts and a letter of free passage to get back to the shores of northern Egypt and then take a boat and ferry back to Italy. It turns out that that... Sultan, that Muslim, when he was dying, many years after, he asked for Franciscan priests to come. And the Muslims got him his wish. He died Catholic, and he died baptized. Now that's the real ecumenism, convert souls. So St. Francis was not this modernist Vatican II New Mass styled ecumenist. No way. He loved Jesus Christ and he knew he was the true God and he would die for him and he had no fear going to the head of the Muslims to try to convert him. That is the spirit we need from St. Francis. That true charity to win souls to the love of Jesus crucified. O Mary conceived without sin, pray, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us, pray for and for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.